Man, that's awesome. Welcome to Big Church Preschoolers. Parents, you'll make it. I, there is hope. There's hope. Hey, we're glad to have our preschoolers here. This is a Christmas Eve, and our church is an all-family thing, so we do it all together. We want to have everybody in the building. Now, if your preschooler gets restless, feel free to get up, move to the edge of the building, get them, let them walk around. If, if you, if, teenagers, if your parents get restless and they need to walk around, feel free to walk your uh, aging parents around to keep them engaged. Whatever it takes, we're in it together, all right? Hey, glad you're here. Open your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there are pew Bibles. The book of Galatians. The book of Galatians was written to some people who lived in a region called Galatia. And you have Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Those are all pretty big books. Then Galatians. And then you'll find uh, other books written to uh, people from Ephesus and Philippi and uh, Colossae and other places. Galatians. Now, I want you to think about the importance of timing today. That, that's our... Our focus is timing. Does, does timing make a difference in this world? Have you ever had uh, the experience of missing a plane by just minutes because boarding had already closed, because traffic, other complications came? You had a late connection, and timing is important. Uh, you parents of preschoolers, how, how much can happen in just a minute when a preschooler is out of sight? Anything is possible. Anything is possible. They can dismantle a car. They can do anything in a minute. Uh, timing is very, very important. Uh, does timing make a difference when uh, somebody misses, you know, just, just one, one block is missed. One pass isn't caught. One defensive player is out of position. You know what happens if that happens? You don't win the state championship uh, as an Allen Eagle. That's what happens. Hey, congratulations to our Allen Eagles. All right. Yeah, a little bit of time makes all the difference in the world. And the minutes and the hours this time of year are, are busy, and we can get so complex, complicated in our Christmas celebrations that we miss the real focus of Christmas and the meaning of Christmas, the miracle of Christmas. Galatians 4, just an opportunity for us to share that hope again. Now, in the book of Galatians, so they said, well, that's a weird spot to go for a Christmas story. The Christmas story shows up all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament. It is, and what we've been focusing on during our messy Christmas series in December, we've been focusing on not just that Jesus came, but why he came. And this is one of the great why he came passages. So this from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Here's what God's word says. But in the fullness of, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. And because you were sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now don't miss the importance of, uh, verse 4. In my translation, it says, when the fullness of time had come. It means at just the right time, at the perfect moment, that's when Jesus came. He didn't come too late. He didn't come too early. In God's perfect plan, he came at just the right time. Now, in the Bible, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a great chapter on time. And it has the, those famous words, there's an appointed time for everything. There's a time for every event under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. And there's a whole set of circumstances that occur in life that God has a perfect timing for. Nothing is lost to God in timing. And that, that passage ends with, he, God, has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their hearts. So Jesus came. Now, some people say, well, why didn't Jesus come a few centuries earlier or a few centuries later? Why was Jesus born then? Because it was the perfect time for him to come, for the gospel to expand rapidly, for, for the gospel to be received so quickly and openly by so many. And God prepared the world. Historians tell us that across the Roman Empire, across the ancient Near East, there was a sense of expectation 
that God had stirred in people's hearts. An expectation that a Savior, a Deliverer was going to come. And we see it written about in, in the historical records all over, different cultures, different religious backgrounds. The ancient idolatry and superstitious religions, they, they were losing their grip on the people's hearts for sure. People were searching. Isn't there an answer? Isn't there something that, that holds truth, that truly gives hope? Isn't there something else? available to us and the miracle of Christmas is the miracle of the moment at just the right time God sent his son into the world I want to tell you this the miracle of Christmas is not just that God came into the world the miracle of Christmas is why he came to take away our sins and the miracle of Christmas is he still comes to our lives at just the right time when we need him most Romans chapter 5 says when we were utterly helpless Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. When do you need a miracle? When, you, when you're feeling helpless and hopeless, when you've exhausted your own resources, when there's nowhere else to turn, when you know, okay, there's, there's nothing I can do to change this circumstance, that's when you're the best position to receive that miracle from God, that word from God, that word of, of, of hope and and peace, and love, and joy, all those messages that come with the story of Christ. And here's the thing about Jesus. He came at just the right time. God's been doing that for a long time, all through the Old Testament. He comes at just the right time, and he still comes today at just the right time when we need him most. Let's pray. Father, on this day, I pray that you be working in us. I pray, God, that we would hear your voice We'd find what we need for what for this day, for our lives, at just the right time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let me tell you a story <clears throat> from the Old Testament about timing and desperateness. Um, during the ministry of a prophet by the name of Elisha, a lot of miracles showed up on the scene. Um, this uh, story I'm getting ready to tell you it's going to start out, and it's going to sound like something that happens probably every day, and it's probably happened today in Dallas. And the story starts out about a man who died and passed away, and he left a young widow and presumably two young boys in this home. We don't know much about the guy. We don't know how he died. We just know he passed away. He died. Um, we do know, though, that he was a God-fearing man. And uh, he was the son of a prophet. We also know that he left the family in a bad place financially. Um, in fact, we get the added detail that, um, that the woman who was left behind, the two boys, they were such in bad debt that the creditors in that area were coming to bear on her. And they were demanding uh, money, and if she didn't give the money, that they were going to take the two boys and sell them as slaves. So it's, it's really a bad situation. And so at this point, I, I often ask myself, where's her family, right? Where's the community? Where's the people she knows? We're, we're told her husband was part of the faith community. He was a son of a prophet. So where's the faith community? Nowhere to be seen. And it's very clear from this story that the community was, was going to let this woman, this widow, and her two boys just implode on each other, and they didn't give a rip. What I also didn't tell you is this story just shows up in 2 Kings chapter 4. It just shows up. There's no warning. There's no lead up. There's no, nothing to follow up. It just, bang, it's right there in the middle of the Bible. And many people believe that this story was dropped in to demonstrate and to illustrate how bad things had gotten in the nation of Israel, that it's at the point where there's a man who dies who's part of the faith community, and the community would allow this woman and her kids to implode upon themselves, and they didn't care. When a community reaches that point, they're at a really dark place spiritually. So the story picks up. What does this woman do? Well, she does what any religious or people would do they run to the most religious person they know and they run to elijah who's the prophet and elijah she comes to him and elijah says all right what do you got in your house he's thinking like a man 
we're going to put something on eBay or Craigslist. What do you got? We can sell. And she says, uh, all I got is this little jar, this clay jar of, you know, just a little bit of oil left. That's all we got. And he said, great. Tell you what, take your boys, and I can relate to this as two boys. I had a brother. Send them into the community and collect all the empty jars you can get. And so they start running through the community. Now, by the way, this is the only thing the community provided for was a bunch of empty jars. It's worthless. So they collect empty jars, and they come back. And he said, "Uh uh-uh, not enough. Go back and get some more. So the boys run, get some more empty jars, and they bring them into the house. They said, there ain't any more empty jars in our community. He goes, great, shut the door, which is pretty cool. He just wanted them to experience this. He said, all right, this is what I want you to do. Take that original jar, clay jar that just had a little bit of oil, and what I want you to do is I want you to start filling all these jars with that one little jar. I know what you're thinking. You're like, what? You know, but when you're desperate, you're going to do whatever they tell you, right? So sure enough, she starts filling the jars. And you know the story. She fills every single one of them up, and then she gets to the last jar, and there's no more oil. So she filled this whole room. So her house is full of oil, and oil was a commodity back then. It was like money. And so he looks at her, and he goes, go sell those jars and pay off your creditors. End of story. That's it. No, nothing anymore. I've got to believe years later, they're still telling that story in that community. In fact, it was, a more, it was memorialized in the Bible. Think about it. Years later, those two boys, I'm sure they got married, had kids and grandkids, and those grandkids would come up to their grandfather and go, tell us about the day that, uh, that God showed up with the oil. See, that day, God's timing produced a desperateness in that woman and also produced a rapid obedience, and they all converged to grow her faith and her trust in God and to make God look good. I found myself treading water. The waves were lapping around me, and the events of the few past week were just rushing through my head. For you see, the word of the Lord had come to me and said, Go preach to Nineveh because of their wickedness that they may repent. Really? Are you serious? Nineveh? The capital of the Syrian Empire? Our sworn enemy? I didn't want them to be be able to repent or to be spared. So I decided that I would board a ship headed in the opposite direction to the city of Tarshish. Well, not long into our voyage, a storm arose, and the winds were so fierce that the seasoned sailors feared not only for the boat, but for their very lives. They tried everything that they knew to save us. They threw the precious cargo overboard to lighten the ship, but to no avail. So they decided to draw straws, and I picked the short straw, and I confess that I was fleeing from God's appointed message and journey that I was supposed to take. And I told them that if they would just throw me overboard, that all would be well. But no, they tried to row back to shore, so the storm became more fierce and worse than it was before. And left with no other option, they threw me overboard, and the storm was quieted. So there I was, treading water, my strength running out, no hope in sight. I found myself in a situation worse than anything I could ever think of. And then at just the right time, God sent a gigantic fish to swallow me and to save my life. You know, there I was, no hope, running out of resources and strength, headed in my own direction. And all the time, God was pursuing me to show me His love for me. And I remembered that God was not done with me yet. Being a disciple, I got to see so many great things that Jesus did. 
walking beside him, I got to see miracle after miracle and see him love people in, in every day. But this one story stands out to me, and it was towards the end of his time here on earth. And we were on the outskirts of the Jerusalem. We stayed away from Jerusalem because we had just run across some opposition. They wanted to stone us. And so we knew that we had to stay away from Jerusalem. And we were in the outskirts just sitting there ministering to people. And Jesus was loving on people and talking about how he was going to pay the price for all of us. And we were wondering what this was. And then all of a sudden we had this servant come and said, Jesus, your beloved brother, your beloved friend, Lazarus, he's sick and we need you to come and heal him. Jesus looked at him, and we knew that we couldn't go back because this means that we would be stoned. And so Jesus said, I I will come, but we're going to wait two days. And we waited two days in the outskirts. And we kept on ministering, and, and as disciples, we were wondering, why are you not going? You can heal him. We've seen you heal so many people, and this is someone that you love, your friend, Mary and Martha's brother. Why are we not going to heal him? Two days went. And Jesus says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. We need to go to Bethany. Well, the disciples, we all looked at each other and said, you know, this is going to cost us our lives. They're looking to stone us. There's opposition that faces us. But Jesus says, no, we're going to go. And Thomas says, we're going to follow. We're going to follow him. And so we went. We went to Bethany. But before we got to Bethany, Martha comes running up to Jesus. He's dead, she says. You're too late. If you had to come earlier, then you could have saved him. You could have saved him. You're you're too late, Jesus. And he looks at Martha on the ground with tears flowing. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never experience death but have eternal life. And she looks at him and he says, do you believe this, Martha? And she says, yes, Lord. Yes, I believe this. Martha went back and she got Mary. And see, Mary was surrounded by the community because in that day when someone passed away, the community would come around and they would just sit in the house as a comfort. Wouldn't say anything just to be a comfort. And Mary left and they wondered Mary must be going to the tomb of Lazarus. So they followed her. And she ran to Jesus and said the same thing that Martha said. You're too late, Jesus. You loved Lazarus. Why are you coming now? He's dead. If you would have just come earlier, he would be alive. And he looked around at all of us as we were just weeping. And with sorrow in his heart and with tears, he wept as well. For the love that he had for all of us, we knew that he loved us dearly. And he said, take me to the tomb. And we get to this cave with a stone rolled. And he says, open that tomb. And with a loud voice, He says, Lazarus, come out, come out. And Lazarus comes wrapped in his burial clothing. Four days he had been in that tomb and Lazarus was coming out. Little did we know that a week later, Mary and Martha and us would be standing outside another tomb that was rolled away that Jesus had come out of. That his father had cried out, Jesus, come out of. That he defeated death for all of us. See, we thought that he was late. It was too late. But just at the right time, even in our agony and pain, he felt our sorrow. He knew what he was going to face. And just the right time, Jesus came to save us all. To overcome death. And Lazarus walked again. And Jesus walks today with each one of us, Emmanuel. And just the right time, we experience him. I love the line in that song, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 says, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Talk about at just the right time. Every day, God wants to give us exactly what we need to make it through each day. It's not a promise to, to make life easy. It's, it's not a promise that we won't face hardships. It's a promise of God's presence, a promise of His strength, the things that we need to face each day, this day. 
And we're able to move forward because we know that God will be there again. The promise to never leave us, to never turn his back on us. The promise that he goes before us and that he also journeys with us. What an amazing gift that he gives to us. And I, I'm not sure what brought you here this morning, uh, but I do know that your presence here today, it's, it's not by an accident. This is an appointment, uh, what we'd call a divine appointment that God has set for us. And we're here because there's something that God, he wants to say to us, something that he wants to communicate directly to you and to me. And this December, our theme here at, at FBC Allen has been Messy Christmas. And I know that, that when you walked in here, uh, when we walked into this room, we, we probably brought a lot of mess with us. Um, mess that it could be relationship mess, it could be financial mess, it could be emotional mess, it could be uh, things to do with your health, it could be grief, hopelessness, fear, worry, whatever it is that you walked in here with, I want you to know that God wants to meet you in your mess and he wants to give you hope. 2 Corinthians 6 2, it says, Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. God wants us to know that today is the day of salvation. God wants to give us a gift. He wants us to give us the gift of new life in Him. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the right time. He's asking us to stop living life our own way. He knows we're living without Him leads us. He knows that, that He sees the hurt and He sees the brokenness. He sees the shame and the guilt, the frustration. He knows that when we try to do it on our own, that he knows where that gets us, and it gets us nowhere fast. It breaks his heart when we, when we try to put our trust and our hope in other things like, like money or, or status or, or maybe trying to be good in some type of religion or in relationships. And he hurts when he sees us when we're trying to medicate our own brokenness. You see, God, he's pursuing us, and he longs for that relationship with you. He wants to heal your brokenness, and He wants to give you a new perspective in which to see your life. You're here today because God wants you to know that He loves you, and He's calling you to Himself. He wants you to stop running, to stop trying to do it all on your own, and surrender to Him. He loves you. God not only wants to give us the gift of salvation, but He wants us, His followers, to be His ambassadors of hope. He wants us to share the gift. Today is the, salvation, the day of salvation. The right time is now, which means that we must be faithful in sharing that message of hope. You see, God is calling us to go into the messy world and to share that message of hope, to be the light. There are people that we know, people that we love, people that we care about, that we work with, that we do life together, and they need to know Jesus. They need to know of this hope. They need to have this light. And for most of them, the only way that they're going to hear about the hope, the only way they're going to hear about Jesus is if you tell them. It's no accident that you're in their lives, that God has placed us in our sphere of influence. God is the gift giver, and as his followers, we are called to share that gift. You see, because as we just saying, God gives us strength for today and a bright hope for tomorrow. Great is his faithfulness. May we be a people who put our hope in him and may we be a people who proclaim that hope. The right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. The gospel story we often think about as a, a Matthew story or a Luke story. But John has a pretty good uh, Christmas story too in his gospels. He begins in chapter 1 verse 1 and this is how John painting the picture of Jesus from eternity past to eternity forever. Here's how he tells the story. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and that life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overpower it in John chapter 8 Jesus described himself in one of the great I am statements there's several of I am statements of John's gospel and Jesus said I am the light of the world he told us this too 
He came to be a light in a dark world. He came to overcome the darkness caused by sin and brokenness and to deliver us. Give us hope and help and peace and comfort and joy and victory and to experience the love of God. But, but all those things are not something just to be, to be cherished in our own hearts, but always is to be shared. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, this is, how, this is how Jesus said it to his disciples. These are the people who are following him. And this is what he said to him. He said to them, he said, you are the light of the world. Now, it's not just that you've experienced Jesus as the light of the world, but you are the light of the world. And he entrusts to us this good news of Jesus, that we would pass it to the rest of the world that the whole world would know that there would be no place left in Allen, Texas, no place left in Collin County, in this state, in this nation, to the ends of the earth. There would be no place left where the good news of Jesus, the light of the gospel, has not been declared. And so, because of faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus is the light of the world. And I am the light of the world. And you are to be the light of the world.